and test it. Say test. Is it looks test. Like it's going through okay? Good morning, everyone. Hi. Now let me go on our Facebook just to make sure there's not any comments here. Here we go. So we've got a video today that's going to be about 24 minutes long, so we're going to have to end in about 15 minutes on the class part. Craig Souser, I, we might have gotten uh, we might have gotten to talk talking a little long uh, about fly tying. So one of his expressions is fly tying, and what I mean by that is tying flies to fish with, and it's real arts and it's real kind of like an arts and crafts kind of experience. It's pretty neat. So he's he zoomed in from Bozeman, Montana, where he is right now, and. Um, so we'll be playing that in at about five till, um, or about, yeah, about five till. So um, I have with me one of my favorite people in the world. This is my daughter, Elizabeth Gott. She goes by Ellie. Ellie, you want to say hi? Hi there. <laughs> and uh, she is, a, uh, you know, this series is about, um, you know, Byron's been doing a great job with it as far as just connecting uh, sort of understanding an idea, a theology maybe, of creativity, uh, how we make stuff and why that's important, how we create new things and, and, and why that's important, and how in, he's brought up a lot of um, biblical references about um, how they made the temple and how the Spirit of the Lord came upon the people to, to make crafts and do all these beautiful things in worship. Today we want to just talk briefly about a few scriptures um, on creativity and the religious imagination. Creativity and the religious imagination. Imagination inspired by the Word of God, rooted, rooted in a tradition of people. Uh, so let's, let's take a few scriptures. Isaiah 61 and... Ellie, I don't know if you could go grab a Bible real quick. There's one right there. Isaiah 61, um, and let me, let's get, give you the verses here. Yeah. So we're going to read Isaiah 61, 1 through 3. And then, uh, Ellie, if you could look up Isaiah 49, 15 and 16. And then we'll read Ezekiel. So let us pray before we read the Word of God. Thank you, God, for your, your Word written. God, illuminate us through your Spirit and help for us to hear. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. So the Spirit of the Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me. He has set, sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to the display of his glory. I mean, what a beautiful text, right? Beauty for ashes. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. And this is the text that Jesus used on the day sort of of his inauguration as a minister. He stood up in the middle of the synagogue and quoted the scripture and then said, Today this, day, this, this scripture is fulfilled. And they wanted to kill him because they knew what he was saying. But it's, a, it's, it's actually a scripture of liberation, a scripture of what they call jubilee, which is every 50 years, Everyone gave their land back, or they were supposed to. And it was supposed to be a, a re, radical redistribution of the, uh, of the land to get back to the original, to reform the, the people back towards people and to God, not just ownership. Um, now, if you could read uh, Isaiah 49, 15 through 16. Notice the maternal, the maternal images given, uh, uh, ascribed to God by the writer. 
Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. A mother will not forget the baby at her breast. But even if she forgets, I will not forget. Wow. So, Ellie, what do you think about when you read scriptures like that? And you're a creator, you're a songwriter, you're a writer, you're a photographer. How, how does your religious identity as, as a believer in Jesus, as, as someone who believes in the Holy Spirit's work in your life, how does that connect with your religious imagination and with your creative imagination there? How does it connect with your imagination? Well, I think um, it's hard for me to uh, create or imagine anything without some sort of foundation. And um, Christ, Christ's image of sort of on the cross suffering and... Um, the image of salvation and resurrection, I've noticed is a reoccurring theme in in usually what I create, which is kind of the the hero story archetype or the dark night of the soul and the resurrection. Um, that's something that really resonates with me. The entire message of the crucifixion and resurrection, I feel like informs a lot of my creative projects because I'm able to see myself reflected in Christ as we all can, because it's all of our stories. And um, then I kind of add my own little pizzazz on it, and I think that that's the Holy Spirit. I think creativity, um, ideas are kind of just floating above us all the time, circulating all the time, like a wind current. And when we open to it, it falls in our laps. I feel like God is like constantly like, who's going to take this song? Who's going to take this painting? Who's going to take this lecture? You know, <laughs> and whoever's looking up at that time receives it. It's like whenever you've seen, um, uh, there's been many times where uh, an artist that I really love will release a song that I feel so in my bones, like, God, I resonate with that. And sometimes I wonder if that was like offered to me and I was not looking up at that time. Um, so yeah, I just think the, my, my religious, my, my spiritual outlook of, of being open and in prayer and introspective, that's kind of central to my creative so, but projects. So you're not thinking, okay, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Therefore, I'm going to write a song. That's not how it works, right? No, it's, I, I don't think about it that hard. Right. Um, it's something that's woven into me, and since I was a child, um, mm -hmm. has always been a story that's been on my heart, not on my brain all the time. So, really, creativity, no one creates really out of a vacuum, right? No one creates something ex nihilo from nothing. You're still using parts, right? You're still part of a creative... When you create something, you're part of a creative tradition, right? If you're, if you're doing knitting, well, knitters have gone before you to show you the way, right? And it's, it's taught through, through person to person, right? Um, you don't create out of a vacuum. When you think about, for instance, rock and roll music as that sort of Delta Blues thing on the west side of Tennessee and the Mississippi uh, Valley. And then you see the hillbilly music, what they used to call the hillbilly music coming out of Appalachia, eastern Tennessee or West Virginia. And then you have the gospel music coming out of the churches of, different, of black and white churches, right? And you have this sort of river, three rivers coming in to each other, and that and out pops rock and roll. That's kind of what I'm talking about. Blues singers, 
develop because they studied other blues singers, right? Painters study other painters. And for a lot of artists, their religious tradition, it's not a constrictive reality, but it is a liberating reality. So you don't think in terms of the church institution being a, a, a space of control over your thought life. I think religions can be that way. And Christianity and Christian churches can be that way where, we're trying to contr- where we try to control a thought life. But at its best, religious traditions open you up, right? They open you up to the possibilities of creation and recreation, of understanding the narrative of our lives in a way that is, um, that is liberating, not confining, right? Um, I remember being in a prison, a maximum security prison, and this one prisoner who was part of the prison ministry there was playing piano and singing. He said, I've never been so free as, as when I'm in prison. And that just that idea that he, he, he found um, he needed to be there at that time, but he found a freedom even inside those bars that he, he couldn't relate to until he got there. And the idea that religion, a religious community and the narrative of faith that we find in Scripture is not there to control us, but to free us, Right? to be creators in the world and to participate in God's creativity. Um, I love that image that you talked about. It's like the, uh, the creative idea is swirling like a wind above you. It's a beautiful image of the Holy Spirit. John Prine would always say, you know, if you don't write it down, then that song's going to go to someone else. <laughs> um, I love that. Um, but there's a guy named Richard Foster who writes about the disciplines, the, the spiritual disciplines. And um, there's this wonderful book. It's probably 30 years old. I think it's called The Spirit of... What's it called? The Spirit of the Disciplines? Wendy? Uh, by Richard Foster. Yeah, The Spirit of the Disciplines. You're right. Thank you, Kyle, in the back. Um, it's probably 30 years old, but there's a whole chapter in there about imagination. So there's prayer. There's uh, contemplation. There's fasting. And there's imagination as an actual exercise of spiritual, of the spiritual life. Uh, now, we, we're not always open to that. Uh, sometimes we're not open to it. Sometimes we see, we, we see creativity in one, one thin area, um, which is unfortunate for us as the church. And we've done bad things to people because of it. There's a guy named uh, Gordon McDonald who, no, not Gordon McDonald, um, Sorry, I have George McDonald, who wrote um, The Back of the North Wind, some phenomenal writing. Mark Twain was influenced by him. In fact, got to meet him one time. He was a Scottish preacher. Um, Tolkien was influenced by him heavily. C.S. Lewis was influenced by him heavily. These are major literary figures, all, all influenced by George McDonald, who ended up being excommunicated from the Presbyterian Church because they just didn't know what to do with him. He was theologically solid. It's just that he was so wild and so creative that they just didn't know what to do with him. So unfortunately, sometimes religious communities do try to to control your thinking. But at, at its best, like what Jesus is saying, this is a liberation moment. This is a freedom moment, right? And so we can create out of that religious imagination. Just one more thought before we go to the video. I know it's a short class with us today, but any of the, anything else, Ellie, about um, your creative process? I know maybe in the coming weeks you could share a piece you wrote or something, but just your creative process and your connection with um, your how, it, how the rhythms of kind of grace show up in your lives creatively. Yeah, I guess I would just say that um, it's not always fluid and, like, easy. And there are times when, like, I'm very blocked and times where I go months and months without writing a song and times where I feel very stunted and dull and and gray. 
And um, I think it's it's a continual kind of like prayer. It's a it's a continual state of being, in to like surrender yourself and and be vulnerable and be open and allow yourself to be where you are, even if that means um, you don't write songs. You just drink your coffee in the morning and you do everyday life. I think that's okay. And also just a thought that came to mind as you were speaking was um, there are times because of the the story of the gospel where um, you create because you've been burst open by sadness or anger and you kind of get cracked and things pour out in the, in the matter of art form. But there are other times because we're human beings just for the heck of it. You just paint or knit or whatever, and that's okay too. So I think it's just, it's a spectrum. It's, it can be very serious. It can be very heart-wrenching. And then other times it can be like meaningless objectively, um, but important to you. Just, just the, the, the creative act can be nurturing, even if you never do anything with the art you're working on, mm -hmm. right? Mm. Well, thank you all for giving us some time around that. We do have a video uh, in from Bozeman, Montana. This is Craig Souser talking about a tradition that developed for him in his life uh, through not just on his own, but through an uncle who is a mentor to him. He lost his father fairly early, and his uncle was a mentor to him. And then he became a fly fisherman and got really into it with Fred Webb, who was a pastor here in the 90s. Since then, Craig has fished all over the world. And he's going to talk to us almost, it's like arts and crafts. Um, he's going to talk to us about tying flies now. Thank you all. Thanks, Ellie. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm here with Craig Souser. And Craig is uh, in Bozeman, Montana right now. Craig is a passionate a uh, Christian, a uh, member of our church, a uh, business leader, and uh, one of his most cherished parts of his life is uh, fly fishing, getting out in the world. He, he wasn't, he's not going to be able to be at the fly fishing uh, event uh, later today, but he, uh, but he wrote a beautiful devotional to go along with it. So he is sort of um, involved. He was part of Faith uh, Fellowship and Fly Fishing way back with Fred Webb in the 90s and is passionate about teaching. So in the midst of this creativity class, I thought we'd get, um, to, we'd, we'd get in a chance to talk to Craig about uh, fly fishing and fly tying as sort of a creative um, expression of making something. So welcome, Craig. Thank you. It's great to, great to be a part of this, um, albeit virtually. I'd much rather be there to share this in person. Um, I could talk about this, as you know, and do talk about this for hours, and I'll try <laughs> to keep my hands limited. Okay, so so just let's just open up before we get into the nuts and bolts of tie and flies, and uh, just mm -hmm. let's just just ask you about attending to the river, and I, what I mean by that, the whole experience of being mm -hmm. outside, getting mm -hmm. in, in the river, whether you catch <laughs> fish or not, uh, mm -hmm. how, how does that impact you? How has it come to be known for you? And not just as, 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 as you're like, how does it impact you and how does it impact your life in a, in a, in a good way? Yeah. Um, so actually I'll start that with a story. The other day I introduced a young man who had never um, put waders on before, had never had a fly rod before, um, had never caught a fish on it you know, any kind of fish before on a fly rod, obviously. Um, and I took him to the Madison River, which is a spectacular, you know, trout river out here in Montana. And he didn't catch anything, but he had a great time. And he was, you know, it was a beautiful sunny day. The Madison um, River sparkles. Um, it is truly a, a, a wonder of this earth. And so as the instructor for the, it was a tough fishing day for everybody. Mm -hmm. I caught two fish. So, and we didn't spend that much time actually fishing, but I was a little concerned that, okay, Andrew or Anthony didn't get one. How's he going to feel? He had the same visceral reaction that I did the first time I did it. Cause I didn't catch one either. Mm -hmm. And it was, I had a great time. It was beautiful today. 
and I didn't think about the office at all. <laughs> and, you know, that for me for oh, wow. a long time was probably the biggest attraction is I just got away from everything. I was off the grid, no cell phone. Right. If you wanted to reach me, you're going to have to drive to the river and find me because I was there uh, almost all but hiding. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it was also a time for reflection, for devotion, for connecting with God and nature, all, all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's continued. I've shared that a lot. Um, it's Friend, grown. friendships too, right? Uh, Friend, like, oh, like you've come to know the guides, some of the guides you use and your, and your fishing buddies, like I'm one of them. I mean, yep. we get really tight doing that, don't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I should have a bumper sticker that says my best friends are fly fishing guides. <laughs> it, you know, those, those are the guides so that I'm always sort of thrilled when a guide asks me to just to go fishing, not, you know, not to hire him, just, like the two of us just go fishing sometime. And, yeah. and I've done that with a number of them. And, you know, they're professionals. I would say I'm a really good amateur, but I'm not a professional. They're at a whole nother level. Mm -hmm. um, but I really do enjoy those, those times. And, you know, they're doing something I'm passionate about every, almost every day in the summer and um, being out there in nature and, and helping people. It amazes me um, how, um, well they do with it because you know the guy that I fish with out here Steve he probably guides 150 days a year and I asked him well how many days you just go fishing mm -hmm. and the number was five wow and it's man how can you be that in love with something you don't really get to do it and and the answer is what I've learned is when you're helping someone else learn to fish and you can take what you know and move that into their fingertips and their arm and, and their shoulders and, and their head and get them to perform, it is incredibly rewarding. And you start using the term, well, here's what we caught today. It's mm -hmm. not what he caught or I right. caught, it's what we caught. Right. Very exciting. Well, when I fell in love with it, I, I, I would just see my brother, who's five years older, and my dad, doing this beautiful cast and today we're going to be fishing out at the park and I know there's going to be some little ones there and they may not do a lot of fly casting, but they're going to see that beauty happen and that yep. relationship happen. So, you know, yep. getting away from the office, getting out in the river, uh, the whole experience, but also the friendships that you've developed, the creative part, there's a lot of creativity in fly fishing all the way around. But it's yep. not, not as if you can't afford your flies, right? Now, sometimes people just, it just gets so expensive. You just need to tie your own flies if you're going to fish that much. That's yeah. not really yeah. where you are necessarily, but you've decided to tie flies because there's something yep. there for you. Talk to yeah. us about how you got into it and then show us a yep. little bit about what you do and how it works. Okay. So first of all, um, anyone that starts tying flies to think they're going to do it to save money is they're mistaken. It's, <laughs> it's a huge investment. You never have enough material. You never have the right material, um, which is actually one of the fun parts about it. At, at some point I'll speak to that later, but um, you know, I, I fished for, Oh gosh, probably 15 years and bought every fly that I um, fished. And I still buy a lot of flies. I have, I'm going to guess thousands of flies, mm -hmm. um, countless fly boxes that are full of them. But um, I, I got into it. I was told by so many people that did tie that said, you know, you're not, you just, you're not going to really appreciate fly fishing until you catch that big fish with a fly that you tie. And, and they're absolutely right. Um, it's rewarding. It's fun. Um, as I said earlier, you don't ever have all the materials unless you own a fly shop. And even then there's probably something you miss. So I will, I'll use a pattern that I might buy a fly shop and I like it. And then I go home and want to replicate it. And I can't because I don't have exactly those materials. So I look in my stuff and I put things together that are close and um you know imitate it and even if i can replicate it um pretty well i might still just put a little something different in there 
just with the notion, well, if I bought it in a fly shop, somebody else could have. That means that fish could have seen that fly before. I want to give him something just a little bit different. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's just been, it's been a lot of fun. It's a great thing to do on those nasty January, February days when you can't get out there and fish. Um, YouTube is loaded with videos on sort of how to get started, how to do it. Um, and I really didn't want to spend too much time like showing it, but I, but I did think I could give you a little bit of a, a quick tour. That'd be of great. What, you know, what exactly is a fly in the first yeah. place? So um, I'm going to switch the camera over here. And mm. so in front of us, we've got quite an assortment of corner um that that tiny little fly is what we would call a midge or do call a midge it's a, a size i think whoops i dropped it it's a size 20 mm. so um wow. tiny tiny little thing i don't tie very many small flies my dexterity isn't that great and honestly you can buy those pretty inexpensively and let someone else deal with that so that, that tiny little fly, the whole way up to a beast, like the one I just put down, mm -hmm. that looks like a small animal, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're being used to catch the same fish, potentially, you know, to go after. Th these are all trout flies in front of us. Um, you know, we have things like um, a hopper, which is really a popular fly in Montana, imitating a grasshopper all kinds of shot sizes, different colors, mm -hmm. um, amazing, you know, what kind of grasshoppers these fish eat. Um, th this is a very, very famous well-known pattern called a woolly bugger. Still has some of my tippet attached <laughs> to it because it's been fished. Um, this fly is, and I'm going to show some material here in a second. This is called a golden retriever. Um, mm -hmm. And it, you know, it's one of my favorite flies, not just because of the name and my love for golden retrievers, but it works. Um, mm -hmm. I actually remember you catching a fish down at Muddy, uh, North Muddy with that particular fly. Right. I remember that. Um, and one of the things about it is you can see I've got three of them here, olive, tan, and black, all essentially the same pattern, just different color combinations. And, you know, some work real well one day on a given stream and the next day they don't, you can never really figure it all out. And that's one of the fun things, but you know, to, to create something like that, you'd start with a, a hook you, know, you get, you buy these in packs. Mm -hmm. This is a streamer hook. Those are streamers. Um, you'd have some material like this that is um, marabou that would create that tail. Um, we, of course, need thread on a bobber, and I have, as you can see, this is actually my small thread um, collection. I have another collection in Pennsylvania. It's about three times that size. Mm. Um, so, again, just a ridiculous amount of material can go into all this that you don't use it all at once. But, you know, you, you tie everything on with this thread. Um, in this case, these have what's called a cone head, and they go on provide some weight and a shape to the fly. Um, those flies also have you know, this kind of material used for the body. It's a mm -hmm. synthetic, obviously. And you're wrapping, that, you're wrapping that material around the right. Foot, so, right? right, so you tie it down, you wrap it, and then you tie it down again and, and move on. And one of the things that, um, to be honest, Sue, my wife said, you know, you really don't want to even try it because you're not going to like it. You don't have the patience for it. Um, you know, I just can't imagine you're going to enjoy it. And to some degree, you could have said that about me going into fly fishing in the first place is would I be patient enough? Um, you know, I'm very active and, you know, would I really bond with this sport? And fly tying has been the same answer as fly fishing. It's that requirement to be patient that I love about mm -hmm. it. And, you know, it gives you peace just mm -hmm. getting into it and immersing, immersing yourself. Um, so you could also, you know, wrap it with this is called chenille. It's an olive chenille. And I could say, well, I'm a purist. I don't want to use any synthetic materials. Um, I'm going to use, you know, all naturals. And you can put 
things like flash in there mm -hmm. to make it more attractive. So that's one of the things where, um, where it reflects the light is the, yeah, the light exactly. comes through the water. It sparkles, and sparkles. And, you know, does, does the actual bait fish I'm trying to imitate do that? It might, but mm -hmm. it might also just be something to get that fish's attention. Mm -hmm. And I'll speak to that in a minute too. You may also weight your fly down with wire and wrap mm -hmm. that around. So, um, again, I'm not going to get into all that. If somebody really wants to get into this, I'm happy to talk to them. You can just go on YouTube and find countless videos. Um, it, really feel, it really feels like arts and crafts, doesn't it? It, I mean, it is very much like that. Um, yeah. I'm going to show you what I call my big boy fly box. Mm -hmm. um, that's this thing. Mm. Um, these are all streamers. Um, it's a massive box to carry I really only would take this on a boat mm -hmm. where we're going to throw obviously big flies trying to get big fish um so you know you really have all kinds of options in terms of what you might want to tie mm -hmm. some people really get into tying dry flies that can be very intricate and involved um back, you know, there, I just back like, there at the back craig back yeah. there at the back right there's some dry flies i can see Yes, uh, and and that's a fly fly that floats on top of the as, right. as if a fly is literally coming down and going to sit yep. on the water. Right. Yeah, the, it would float down the yeah. water, yeah. like you mentioned. This is um, this is a salmon fly imitation, a, a monstrous dry fly. People <laughs> might say, "Well, there aren't bugs that big." Well, they're they're flying objects way bigger than that. Right. Right. And this is a small little. Um, atoms, parachute mm -hmm. atoms, it floats as well. Yeah. And, and that guy, even though it looks really small, there are fly, dry flies way smaller than that that we might use, you know, trichos and midges to go after, mm -hmm. you know, and fish that are feeding. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are times even with the midges that you might hook a 20-inch fish with a midge, a tiny little fly, or yep. you might hook a 20-inch fish with a big fly like a like what you have there with that big. Yeah. Um, well, and, and as you know, you fished the Depew Spring Creek with me. Right. And this, this little midge nymph yep. is a pattern I use there regularly. Um, I had a, a guide mm -hmm. <laughs> come the other week from Utah, who's one of my fishing buddies, took him over there. He had tied a really, really tiny little betas fly and he had a 30 fish day because he figured it out. He dialed oh, it in and it was remarkable to watch. He had seen that, that bug work on another river nearby and said, Hey, let's, let's try this here. And sure enough, it was like magic. That is um, so great. And so he, he kind of, he kind of decoded what was needed that day. Yeah. We, we call it cracking the code. Crack the code. And then the fish were all over everywhere. Oh, it was amazing well, to you and I have had those kind of days. We've also had the kind of days where you don't catch much, but it's fun either way. There's, yeah. a, there's a day recently on the Madison River where, uh, where you tied a fly, and I'll share yep. the picture of okay. the fish in a minute. Can you just tell the story a little bit about how you came upon tying that fly or, or how you decided to fish that day and sort of the pushback yep. you got? Yeah, so we, we were fishing um, with a guy who is, you know, Steve is my regular guide out here. I actually had a Brian Shoemaker, yeah. um, you know, from, from back east, who's a smallmouth guide in the boat. And we, we were having a tough day. It was a beautiful day, but we weren't catching a lot of fish. So bring, the camera, bring the camera back to you, can you? Oh, sure. There we go. Yeah, there you go. So, so you were, you were with, uh, with Brian, one of the guides from Pennsylvania, and you're yep. with your really good friend and guide, Steve. Steve exactly. Smith. And so you're, you're on the Madison, okay? On the Madison, which, again, is an epic river out here. And, and I had actually, since Brian had never been here before, Steve wasn't real keen on going to the Madison that day. It was busy. Wasn't sure it was fishing all that great. And I sort of said, well, we got to take Brian there. And then, you know, it was um, just before noontime, which is – you know, this, this, there were no clouds. The sun, the sun was really high. And it's not a time you're expecting to catch anything on a streamer. But we were committed to fishing streamers that day. And Steve tied on a real flashy fly. And he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tie two on for you. Um, I'm not sure what I want to give you for the second fly. And I pull open my box. 
handed him a fly, and he said, eh, I don't think so. And I said, well, wait a minute. I used that at Depew Spring Creek last fall, and, man, I just – I did great with it. And you wanted something small. You wanted something, you know, sort of olive. There it is. And he goes, all right, we'll try it. And very reluctantly. Did he know you tied it? Did he know you tied it? And I, I had actually tied this one myself. Again, it wasn't exactly like I used on Depew because I bought those flies, but it was close. And Steve, you know, we tied it on. Um, I made, I think, two casts with it. I saw this monster fish flash, what we call flash. He, he turned. I'm pretty sure he was looking at the flashy fly in the water. I could see my fly that I had tied literally floating right to him. He moved up in the river, ate it. I stripped it back, set the hook, and then it was just an explosion. It was a monster fish. Um, by our calculations, we did measure his girth. We measured his length. Um, there you can see him. Beautiful fish. That's Steve Smith there um, holding him. Um, took us about 10 minutes to get him, which was actually pretty quick all things considered. I can tell you this, the picture does not do that fish justice. He, he was a beast, um, beautiful fish. We made sure he was in great shape, you know, before we let him go. Um, but it was on the fly that I tied and <laughs> we, we nicknamed him um, um, high noon because it was literally high noon when, when we caught him and you, you just don't get fish like that yeah. uh, very often. Um, one of the largest fish we've ever seen in the Madison River. Wow. And so that was caught on your fly. Um, yes. And, yep. and I will say, I know Steve's a professional, but, yep. <laughs> but even professionals get it wrong sometimes. Yeah, that's you know, right. Bobby Jones, the golfer, was never a professional golfer, by the way. Um, right. So right. You, you're, you're an amazing fly fisherman, Craig. So as we're ending up here, uh, I just wanted I, to ask I do. Oh, I'll go just, ahead. Go ahead. Just there's that picture you had. Yeah. And that is the fly that was in oh. that fish. <laughs> oh, wow. Attached to the frame. Oh, wow. How cool. You've got it attached to the frame as a memorial. Right. Oh, that right. is so yeah. neat. Do you, have yeah. a name? Do you have a name for that fly, Craig? Well, it's the high noon fly. High noon fly. That's right. You said that. Well, yes. wow. Thank you. So let me just ask one more thing before we break. Sure. How does your faith connect with fishing or creating something new? How does, I know it, well, I know it connects because you wrote a beautiful devotional, like I said. Mm -hmm. I know yeah. it connects, but tell, just share a little it, bit. Yeah, so it connects on so many different levels. Um, the most basic of which is simply needing to just get away. You had a tough day at the office or, mm -hmm. you know, life's just not what you want it to be at that moment. And um, I need time for meditation, prayer, therapy, cleansing. And you go and you're just in communion with the spirit. I mean, it's incredible. And I've used that just about every day I go fishing. So, yeah. you know, to say it's not common is an understatement. Yeah. 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 So when, when, you, when you walk down to a river... And you say, oh, that's a river. But when you slow down and really mm. look at a river, mm. when, you, when you put your feet in that river, mm. when you feel the river in your hands or you're floating at the top of the river, right. uh, whether, you, you know, whether you're fly fishing or whether you're just waiting and exploring or whether you're bait mm. fishing or whatever you're doing, <laughs> right. you're right. in God's cathedral. And right. I know... One of the things, I'll just share this. One of the things that the first time I went fishing with Craig, he took me out to, um, it was, oh, out near, let's see. I Cadora. Can, the Cadoras Creek. And right. there was about a 20-inch fish that had passed away, probably of old age there. And uh, that's a big fish. And Craig almost came to tears. <laughs> and I knew, I knew at that moment I'd found a, a fishing buddy because he, 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 wa he wanted that fish to live. And, and it does, when you spend time in nature, you, you get more humble and it feels like more sensitive to God's creation. And, yeah. and I think because the Holy Spirit's right there, there's a lot of, a lot of powerful yeah. metaphors in scripture about the river. So. Yeah. Well, and I, and I do talk about it in the devotional you're going to share later, but yeah. 
you know, trout fishing in particular, trout require a really fine balance in the water. I mean, they must have a very specific combination of, you know, um, limestone and, and you know, po- lack of poisons, clear, good water. Yeah. And, um, and cold. And it, it's just such a, such a small window that they live in that that balance clearly is there with a purpose in mind. And we need, our obligation is to help maintain that balance mm-hmm. and be stewards of it. Wonderful. Well, and yep. there's nothing wrong with taking a fish and eating it, right? But, no, of course but, but there's also something very satisfying, uh, being able to touch or get close to a fish and really yep. see it yep. and experience yep. it. It's not liking what we're doing probably, but to see it go back in that river and then advocate for those populations and those rivers is just a whole lot of fun. Absolutely well, it, right. it's been great, Craig. Craig here from Craig Souser from Bozeman, Montana. Uh, and uh, you might not be a guide or a professional, but you're, you're, you're nearly a Bobby Jones of fishing as far as I, I can tell. And I appreciate you, Craig. And come back and see us soon. Uh, back, back at, uh, come back and worship with us. I know you'll, you'll be out in Montana for a bit, but when things yep. open up, we'll look, look forward to seeing you back in York at church. We'll be back in December. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.